welcome to Brainfluence. I'm Roger Dooley. Some business authors write one good book and never really follow up with anything after that. Others write the same book over and over, throwing in a few new stories and examples. But today's guest, Mark Schaefer, my friend, uh, is not one of those. Uh, every book that he launches uh, has interesting new ideas and is quite distinct from those that preceded it. So I'm really excited that he has a new book today. Uh, he is a globally recognized keynote speaker, educator, business consultant, and author. He's worked in global sales, PR, and marketing for 30 years and is executive director of Schaefer Marketing Solutions. He holds seven patents and is a faculty member at Rutgers University. His new book is Cumulative Advantage, How to Build Momentum for Your Ideas, Business, and Life Against All Odds. Welcome to the show, Mark. It seems like today we are all competing against all odds, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that part of the title is uh, extraordinarily meaningful to people today. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's it, it's really symbolic, not just of the, the pandemic has certainly increased the odds, it seems, against uh, many of us, but uh, just the increasing competition in everything, the competition to be seen, to, be, to get the word out. Yes. You know, everybody is creating content. Everybody's on social media. You've got... Uh, uh, people with millions of followers who are uh, eating up the bandwidth and so on. It's, uh, so it, it really is, uh, I think, uh, a great message that, uh, yes, you can compete against these odds. You know, Mark, I love success formula books. I've had, uh, let's see, uh, Albert Laszlo Barabashi on. He wrote The Formula, which is sort of a very data-driven, uh, science-based guide to success. And uh, Ryan Holiday, my fellow Austinite, uh, who also wrote a book called The, the Perennial Seller, yeah. Uh, that may not be his bestseller, but yeah. it is really my favorite of his works because it talks about how to create work that lasts. And you come at it from a little bit different angle uh, in this book. Uh, explain sort of uh, briefly how your formula works. What I was trying to solve here is exactly what you're talking about, is that we're living in this world of overwhelming information density. And especially now, uh, in, in the time of the pandemic alone, I heard that the amount of content published on LinkedIn doubled. And so I think what we're all preoccupied with, if you're a cre content creator, a business person, an entrepreneur, someone in marketing, how can we be heard? How can we be seen? How can we be, be discovered? And it can be really daunting. And I think what's pressing on people is I'm doing everything I can. Uh, I'm doing great work and I still feel like I'm being buried. So it led me to this idea of momentum. How do we create momentum? If you're stuck, sort of feel like you're plateauing, why do some people get to the next level and, and some don't? And it led me to this seminal research that really started in the 1960s about how people create momentum and how the rich seem to get richer, the poor seem to get poorer. If you're one of those people who are rich, you just keep going unless there are countervailing processes that can level the playing field and get people other, get, get other people to build momentum. So that was my quest. <laughs> what are those countervailing processes? And I went down some mighty deep rabbit holes to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one thing that pervades the book is something called the Matthew effect. Uh, yeah. why, why don't you explain what that is, Mark? Well, it's, it's, it's so fascinating how this whole thing started. Uh, there was a famous sociologist named Robert Merton. I'm sure none of your audience has heard of them because uh, who can name any famous sociologist, let's be honest. <laughs> and uh, But in his field, he was quite a, a superstar. He was an immigrant to America. And uh, when he was a little boy, he was growing up in the slums of South Philadelphia. And, and I mean, he couldn't even go to school. He had to work as a little boy to help uh, his family just make ends meet. But each evening, starting when he was five, he would walk to the Carnegie Library in Philadelphia. And he would walk from the slums and into these big neighborhoods with all these big mansions. And he just wondered, how do you get there? Is there any way we just keep getting poor? His father's business just burned down <laughs> to make things even worse. Against all odds, he got a scholarship to Temple. Against all odds, got a scholarship to Harvard. 
against all odds, gets his PhD, he's teaching at Columbia. While he's at Columbia, the students tell him, it's not fair. All these tenured professors take all the credit. They get more rewards, they get bigger offices, they get more staff, but we're doing all the work. The rich keep getting richer, we keep getting poor, it's not fair, he said. I know, but how can we prove it? So he did this research and this led to this paper called the Matthew effect. It's, it, it, it hints at a, at a phrase in the Bible, a, a verse in the Bible that talks about the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And he did his study based on Nobel prize winners. And he found that these were not necessarily the greatest scientists or the greatest researchers, but they had some advantage that propelled them into this momentum. And once they won that Nobel Prize, there was no stopping them. The momentum just kept going on and on and on. And so the cumulative advantage is an expression of this original paper. It's now been thoroughly researched in sports, education, technology, business, entertainment, to show the people that can start with some initial advantage, if you play your cards right, leads to unstoppable momentum. Now, it doesn't always have to be money. It doesn't have to be even education. An example from the book is Bill Gates. Bill Gates, how did he become Bill Gates? As a teenager, he had access to some of the first computer prototypes in the country. He was coding before anybody else. And that became his initial advantage that led him to, he, and he didn't just start with an idea, and this is important, he pursued that curiosity. The timing was right for his idea. And of course, he was the founder of Microsoft. So that's really sort of the, how that idea got started and how it spread. But it's, it's, it's the, the science and the research has never really been applied to normal people's lives, their ideas, and their businesses. So that's the code I tried to crack in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I figured out the problem with so sociologists is they are not marketers because clearly uh, based on even his own research, he should have called that thing the Merton effect, uh, <laughs> made himself famous, uh, garnered more research money and so on. And right. he might've won a Nobel prize himself, who knows? Right. He'd, pro he'd probably be a Snapchat influencer by now. <laughs> Maybe. I'm not, not sure there are too many profs that uh, come, make that grade, but you never know. It's, it's possible. Know. Uh, yeah. So uh, what are, briefly, Mark, what are the stages uh, that you describe uh, of this process to uh, become successful, as, as, you've, uh, as your research showed them to be? Yeah, sure. So there, there are these patterns of momentum that repeat over and over again if you look at successful people, successful businesses. And one of the most interesting ideas in the book, and this comes from a researcher named Franz Johansson. He wrote a book a few years ago called The Click Moment. Now, that sounds like an SEO book, but it, it, it's really about this moment where something random happens to you. You're in the right place at the right time. You, you have a conversation that sparks an idea or you read a book or you listen to a podcast or something changes your view in a random way that creates the spark of initiative. And so momentum always has to start with that spark. What is that initial advantage that you can drive uh, and start to create some momentum? So that's, I think, very interesting. I hope it gives people a lot of encouragement and hope that you don't need to be a millionaire to create momentum. You just need to be aware of how these opportunities are being created all around you all the time. Now, it's important to not just have an idea, but pursue this curiosity and see how this idea, this competency, whatever you're working on, can fit into the context of our world today. And I challenge people to think about strategy in a new way. Instead of a five-year plan and a 150-page document, strategy today is a, is a function of speed, space, and time. Because the world is moving so fast that these shifts 
this, these fractures in the status quo are happening constantly. And every time there's a shift or a fracture, it's a business opportunity. And if you think about this in the context of the era we're in right now, Roger, I predicted last March, I said, there will be more startups in America than any time in our history. Cause it's, been, it's the biggest fracture in the history of, or one of the biggest, let's say, in the history of America. There, there are un, just countless unmet and underserved consumer needs during a pandemic. And in fact, we did have more business startups than any time. If you find that opportunity, you burst through that seam with all your force, all your resources, and get that momentum going. You know, Next. Mike, I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you for a moment. Uh, sure. And while, while we're on this uh, uh, sort of ideation phase of looking for the opportunity, uh, one of the things that you describe in the book is uh, kind of a unique brainstorming process that uh, I wasn't familiar with. But to me, it struck me as a particularly effective way because brainstorming has really gotten a lot of criticism in recent years as just being an ineffective way to come up with breakthrough ideas because you just end up with a lot of random stuff being thrown against the wall, people yeah. writing stuff down on whiteboards and uh, no, no really good original stuff coming out, but most of the time. But uh, your process uh, that you describe is quite different. Why don't you go through that? I think that's a, a good takeaway for our listeners. I, I think it's one of the best idea generation techniques. And I used it, I've used it for, for a couple decades now it's called brain writing. So everybody expects in a normal brainstorming process, you know why you're there. You're supposed to come up with ideas. So everybody sort of has an idea at the beginning of the process. So you say, look, here's a, uh, an easel pad. Write your best idea at the very top of this easel pad. Tear off the piece of paper and stick it on the wall and stand in front of it. Now, move over one space. So now your, your brain is sort of being connected to the person's thought process who was right next to you. And you say, look at that idea and improve on it. Now move over three spaces. So you're not following the same person. You're, you're, you're mixing up mental frameworks. You're not thinking out of the box. You're combining boxes. It's very powerful. It's also, I think, the best case study for diversity you will ever see. Because when I do these sessions, I try to go crazy with diversity, every kind of diversity, because that's how you get the best ideas. Now, so you shift these ideas, you keep improving on the ideas. Maybe you have a few other prompts thrown in there. You might do it six, seven, eight times. Then you say, go back to your original idea, circle the best idea on that page. 98% of the time, they do not circle their original idea. In a period of 30 minutes, you're having fun. And what you've done is you have generated not just good ideas, but breakthrough ideas by iterating on good ideas and taking advantage of the diversity in the room. Yeah, that's such a brilliant approach. And uh, I'm surprised, maybe I've just lived a sheltered life, but I haven't uh, ever been a part of one of those types of yeah. sessions. So uh, that, that's a good one. So I've, in used, any case, I've used that at Dell in Austin a few times. Gee, well, now apparently the Dell folks uh, who have done that uh, and I had, didn't, didn't intersect. Uh, but regardless, you know, so once you've uh, sort of got this ideation process underway, you talk about hitting the seam, yeah. uh, which is a great football analogy for right. uh, those, those folks who may not be familiar with American football, maybe you can describe both uh, literally and figuratively what you're getting at. Well, I, th I think it's, it's, it's a good analogy about how business develops today. Uh, again, it's, it's, it, business really doesn't really develop over you know, some five-year plan. It's just like something that's happening now. So in American football, two teams face off face-to-face, -face, literally face-to-face, -face, strength against strength. Now the coaches are actually above the field, even in high school, in a booth, looking at the field, trying to find a opportunity. Is there someone on the other team who's tired? Are they mismatched? Are they out of place? How can we take advantage of this, of this 
temporary fracture, go through that seam as long as we can, for as far as we can, and then we start looking for a new one. And that's really how we need to approach business today is that these opportunities, the world is shifting and shifting and shifting. It, it's not just economic shifts. It could be shifts in taste, in fashion, in culture, in spending habits. And what I just talked about with the pandemic, Roger, this is just the beginning. I wrote a blog post this week saying, marketing is entering the era of unintended consequences. There are gonna be so many changes in consumer behavior we never even thought of before. Starting with, you know, what's gonna to happen to these children who are being socialized in different ways? They're being educated in different ways. How, how is that gonna change people? How's that gonna change spending habits? One of the unexpected consequences, unintended consequences, when China came out of the pandemic, here's what they discovered, that e-commerce, the function of e-commerce in the family had moved to children because people couldn't go out, just like America. People are buying more and more and more online. And the children who are, who are very good at this are taking that over for their parents and grandparents, saying, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll find this for you. We can find the best deal. Come on, mom. Just let me do it. <laughs> the, the buying function in many, many families is moving to teenagers. Who could have thought of that in the context of the pandemic? There's going to be millions of changes, large and small. And all of these are fractures, shifts, and business opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's kind of interesting because you think of uh, going back to the previous century, the image of the uh, 1950s or 60s housewife who is the principal consumer in the family. If you're going to be advertising just about any kind of household good or food, uh, that was who you wanted to be marketing to. And now you're saying that maybe unexpectedly uh, it's going to be the uh, teens in the family or even younger preteens perhaps yeah. Who are a key part of this buying function, at least for certain products, maybe not everything, but for certain things. <laughs> yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Well, that happened in our family. I mean, my uh, my children took over the buying function of my, for, for their grandparents and just started sending them stuff that they needed. And, and they had never really used e-commerce before. So it, it, it's going to be fascinating. I mean, we've been through a long, sad time. But from an academic perspective, there's never been a more fascinating time to be in marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we have in common, Mark, that I'm probably 100% sure that you don't know about uh, is an interest in wine packaging. <laughs> a, few, a few years uh, back, uh, more than a, a few now, but uh, it was after, after the World Wide Web had been invented, uh, I began uh, writing about boxed wines because I thought uh, or I predicted actually. You were prescient. That, well, maybe not so much that box wines are going to become the next big thing because I noted that in Australia, which was a, kind of a sort of a consumer wine market, not necessarily a snob wine market. Um, at that point, uh, box wines and similar packaging had already taken over supposedly, according to, I didn't personally verify this, but the statistics that I saw uh, taken over like half the market or something close to that. And so I said, okay, well, this, this could be an interesting thing to get into. And as, as it turns out, uh, this is probably uh, 10 or 15 years after that. Uh, it's still a kind of a niche category in the U.S., yeah. relegated to uh, really inexpensive wines for use uh, at, uh, you know, fraternity houses or, uh, you know, maybe I, what I envisioned was the confluence of the one glass of red wine a day recommendation uh, that may or may not actually be true, but that was supposed to be good for your health at one point, uh, and boxed wine packaging, yeah, yeah. Uh, which would prevent wine from going bad so quickly. Uh, it seemed like a no-brainer. Well, apparently I was either too early or simply wrong, but you too uh, have an interest in wine packaging. <laughs> Explain your idea and uh, why maybe uh, hitting the seam uh, didn't work. Yeah, it's a great illustration. Uh, it's a perfect illustration of the idea of how strategy has changed. So, I mean, I was like you, I had data, I had evidence, I had science behind me that showed 
the best way to package wine, not even close, was in an aluminum can. The worst way to package wine that you could ever imagine is a transparent bottle with a cork top. It's, it's the worst way to store wine you could imagine. But there's an image and there's an emotion that goes with that bottle. So I was in the packaging business and I, I got nowhere. I mean, everybody just turned their noses up, up at me. And here we are 10 or 15 years later, and this is the number one trend in wine packaging right now. The 10% of the wine market uh, is now in aluminum cans. Why? Because the demographic has a different aesthetic. They have a different priority. They have a different uh, way of living. They want to throw something in a backpack and go. They don't need a heavy bottle. They need something that's not going to break, that can chill really quickly. They, you know, there's, it's, it's the best uh, package for the environment. So all those things we kind of knew, the timing was wrong. The, the, the market just wasn't there yet. And it wasn't driven by a plan. It wasn't driven by a strategy. It was driven by a seam. And that's the difference in business today. Uh, I, I, I gave the example in, in the book of, um, of, of the you know, creating strategic uh, leverage book, creating strategic advantage book uh, about how marketing was all about you know, finding your lane and staying in your lane for years and years and years. And today it's, it's really, it's about speed. It's about awareness. It's about being nimble and go. When you see that shift, you, you, you charge through that shift. And, and that's really what, what we need to be aware of today in, in terms of strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, th I think the speed point is really important, Mark, because that can compensate sometimes for a size uh, disadvantage where 100%. A, big, a, a big company is going to have massive resources, but they're yeah. probably not going to be very nimble. So if you happen to spot this market opportunity uh, as an entrepreneur uh, or even as an entrepreneur, perhaps in a big company that where you've been given the flexibility to act, then uh, you can be in that area much more quickly uh, and establish your name before the big brands get in there and yeah. do their thing. It'll be interesting to see if Clubhouse can do that. You know, Clubhouse, definitely, it was the right idea at the right time. It's a perfect example of how you create momentum. And now the idea is, so actually this kind of leads us to the next subject, right? Because initial advantage, right? Started this thing. Here's the seam. We're in a pandemic. We've got 20 million people unemployed. They're lonely and they're isolated. What do they want to do? They want to talk. <laughs> so boom, there's Clubhouse. Now they get, what's the next step? Momentum, awareness. How You've got to create vast awareness really fast. In the, boom, in, in the book, I call this the sonic boom. It's not about a six-month plan or a year plan. Nobody cares about that. If you're building momentum, you've got to hit it big and you've got to hit it fast. Clubhouse did a lot of really good things, a lot of really smart things about how they celebrated the emerging celebrities on Clubhouse, about how they increased awareness because if you're on Clubhouse, you automatically get alerts on your phone when famous people are on Clubhouse. Then they went through this round of venture capital, and now they're on all the you know main mainstream media, and it's just booming and booming and booming. And now Twitter has created spaces. Same thing as Clubhouse, bigger company, a lot more money, but it's like okay, well we got Clubhouse. No, but we have spaces. Well, no, we have Clubhouse. So I mean, it, it, right now this is so interesting, Roger. Who's gonna win? Facebook's going to do their thing. Twitter's done their thing. Uh, I heard actually there was another one coming out, right? Everybody, it's, here's, here's what's going to determine who wins. It's not the best platform. It's not the best technology. It's not even the most money. Who has the most momentum? Who can create the most momentum right now? 
And that's why there's not even any talk about monetization at Clubhouse right now. Why? The only thing that's important right now is momentum. Build the user base. Build the user base. We'll monetize later. We got to win this space. They found the seam, and now they have to win the space. Well, that, that's certainly not dissimilar to what uh, companies like uh, Uber did. Oh, exactly. Where, you know, just uh, you don't worry about the profits later. Just uh, get that momentum yeah. going. And you yeah. know, one one example of even a mature market or fairly mature market, uh, I think, is the web conferencing market where Zoom uh, already had been building momentum before the pandemic hit. You know, people think of Zoom as suddenly, wow, the pandemic hit and now everybody's doing Zoom. Uh, they were already accelerating past Cisco and Microsoft in that space, uh, primarily because of ease of use. And when the pandemic hit, yeah, these IT departments were faced with getting hundreds of users uh, in their company online without uh, spending thousands of hours in tech support telling them how to make WebEx work. Uh, it says, what's easy? Zoom's easy. Uh, and, <laughs> And they just, it took off like a rocket. Yeah, but, but I, I just had this thought. When you and I were growing up in business, we wouldn't even entertain the prospect of starting a business without knowing exactly how we're going to make money and when we're going to get money. We wouldn't even think of the idea. We would be embarrassed to talk about a business that had no plan to monetize for three years. I think that's a great example of how this world has shifted and how, how strategy has shifted where it's not a plan. We're going to make this product. Here's our target market, blah, 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 blah. Right now it's look, there's a shift. We got to go right now. Don't worry about anything else. Build momentum, get through that seam. And that's where the world is right now. And, and to, to, you know, if we could, send this story back to our 20 year old selves, we'd be going, you gotta be kidding me. What kind of a world is that? But that is the world today. It's a world of momentum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the ways of boosting that momentum is leveraging people with big followings. And you had some interesting stats in the book, Mark, about how uh, it, when more famous people or people with big followings uh, share your idea or whatever it is, uh, it gets additional momentum beyond even there's sort of a multiplier effect, uh, yeah. depending on how many people are sharing that. So great, great to be shared by one famous influencer, but uh, uh, every one you add, uh, it goes up even exponentially, right? It does, it does. And and this the credit for th for this research is with uh, Steve Rayson, uh, a wonderful, wonderful visionary thinker and researcher. He was the founder of a company called BuzzSumo which is now owned by Brand Watch. And user. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am too. I, it's, it's, it's one of the few platforms I use almost every day. BuzzSumo is awesome. Steve, Steve uh, interestingly, um, I think that was the second or third company he sold. And he actually uh, is now getting an advanced degree in political science and is writing books about political science. But back in the day when he was doing research for BuzzSumo, he did a, a marvelous uh, study that showed how things really go viral. And it's not like you think. It's not like this spider web where a friend tells a friend tells a friend. What he, what he talked about, what he discovered, and I call this the sonic boom, is that it's in a very, very concentrated period of time where all, a lot of people with big audiences are all talking about the same thing in a very condensed period of time. So creating awareness about a business or an idea, a new book or whatever you're working on, it's not a six month rollout. It's two weeks or three weeks and you give it everything you've got to create that, that again, you create that momentum. And it's been shown time and time again to work. And I've personally experienced this as working for me. This is how I've launched my last few books you know, basing, basing the idea on this research. And I knew it was working one day when I saw this tweet and a person said, I've seen Mark Schaefer's book mentioned four times today. I suppose I should go buy it. That's <laughs> the sonic boom, ladies and gentlemen. And so I've got different examples in the book of, of, how, of how that works. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mark, do you think this is a social phenomenon or is this uh, partly or wholly an algorithmic phenomenon where uh, the algorithms used by the Facebooks and LinkedIn's and Twitter's and so on um, somehow pick up on this signal and amplify it uh, you know, beyond what it might do yeah. otherwise? Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's a little of both because, of course, the size of the audience, the authority of the person who's creating the content, that's going to fuel the algorithm. And I think that's why there is this exponential effect, because if the algorithm, algorithm start to sense that this thing is, for lack of better words, trending, then the, the amplification just grows and grows. So it is a function of sort of influence marketing and algorithms and content. And, and I have to emphasize that, I mean, you have to deliver the goods. Uh, you, you, you can't keep that momentum going if you're not creating a great product. You, 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 you can't trick someone into actually reading your book or subscribing to your service, or, or you, you can't trick someone into loving you and loving what you do. So you've, you, you've got to deliver the goods, uh, but how do you create awareness for what you're doing? This idea of the sonic boom is a, is a big idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one uh, other thing I found interesting as you get into connecting with uh, people who can help you to that next step, which is an, another step uh, in your process of, uh, you know, getting, if you, if you can get Oprah to put you on her show, uh, you're probably uh, set uh, for future or win a Nobel Prize or retirement. doing something else. But, uh, but when you are trying to make some of these connections, and it's not necessarily going to be Oprah, but... Uh, uh, but uh, uh, volunteering is a good example because, or is one way of doing that because I, I've certainly seen other people talk about how they got their start. You mentioned, I think uh, Tim Ferriss got his start uh, in, in part by volunteering for certain activities when he yeah. showed up in Silicon Valley. And uh, uh, I think that, let's see, uh, one past guest uh, did some work uh, volunteering for Tim Ferriss uh, and that helped launch his career. So. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it sort of comes around as it goes around, but uh, that, that's an often overlooked way because so often we are focused on, uh, okay, uh, I've got to monetize what I'm doing, uh, and you're not looking for non-monetizable things to do, even though they could be very helpful in the long run. Yeah, I, well, I, again, it, it was I set the book up as this sort of whimsical race, this between myself and and Tim Ferriss. And the reason I chose Tim is because as I was looking for case studies and different people I could feature in the book, I, I was like reading people's biographies, uh, just trying to find different ideas to incorporate in the book. And, I, and, and look, Tim is sort of uh, ubiquitous in all the media now, and he's everything he touches turns to gold. But when you read where he started, and he's been very transparent about this, it's he's really... It was zero. It was, I mean, he was sickly. He had, and I'm not saying anything he hasn't said himself. He's been very transparent. He had health problems. He had psychological problems. He suffered from depression. He had financial problems. And then he lost his girlfriend and he just sort of chucked everything, went to Europe to try to find himself, had this idea for a book, pitched it, was rejected 26 times. Now, could you ever imagine that 10 years from, uh, from that moment, he'd be hanging out with LeBron James and Oprah and Hugh Jackman? And so that's, and, and so when you, when you dissect what happened, he followed this pattern exactly. You couldn't even write a better script. And again, he's been, he's very, very open uh, about what he does and all his experiments to, you know, to get to the, to the next level. And uh, it just it sort of follows this thing exactly. He had, he was in the right place at the right time. It was sort of a random thing. I mean, he wouldn't have written the book if he hadn't lost his girlfriend. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's amazing how it's just uh, how these random events lead to changes in your life that can create new opportunities. He hit a seam. He worked on the sonic boom. He reached up, he had new mentors that were teaching them uh, new things. And uh, 
and this gets to this idea of reimagining mentorship. And you, you talked about how Tim volunteered and met these important people. And he didn't go to them, I want to be, I want you to be my mentor. I want you to enter into this contract with me where you'll help me for the next year. No, he just said every once in a while, I was like, hey, remember me? I met you at this party. Could I just ask you a question? And mentorship today is, is not about a long-term commitment where you're teaching somebody how to do something. If you need to learn something, go to YouTube. You don't need a mentor. What you need a mentor to do is to open up new opportunities, make new introductions, help you solve problems that they can only solve. That is the fastest way to build momentum and get you to the next level. It's just to have someone make some key introduction that changes the whole landscape for you. And that's really, I think, the key idea behind mentorship today. And there's sort of an art and science about, about how do we approach that new idea of mentorship. And I think there's some great actionable ideas uh, in the book. Great. Well, I could keep on going forever, Mark, but that's probably a pretty good place to wrap up. Oh, where can people find you and your ideas? Well, first, thank you so much, Roger. You're always so well prepared. You always ask me questions I've never been asked before. I appreciate that so much. You can find me at businessesgrow.com. We've been talking about cumulative advantage. You can find all that book and all my books there, my blog, my podcast, and lots of other marketing resources for businesses of every size. Great. Well, thanks, Mark. And uh, we will list those places as well as any other resources we mentioned on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast. And we'll have text, audio, and video versions of this conversation there as well. Mark, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks so much, Roger.